Good morning, how are you? Thank you so much to everybody for coming today and thanks so much to the Boston Green Women Commission and to Eversource and to Harvard for hosting this wonderful event. I am in the enviable position of being right before lunch, so sorry about that, I hope I can keep your attention. Um, I'm very excited to speak with you today about laboratory plug loads. So I know that Mark and Ellen have kind of alluded to plug loads and then Quentin and Anthony really directly spoke a little bit about plug loads, but I'd like to just focus your attention now for the next 30, 40 minutes on this very important topic. Before I get started on the presentation, I want to spend a bit of time just motivating you know, what we were doing and why we were doing it, because I think it's really important to provide some context. So My Green Lab is a nonprofit organization. We're based in California. We're about three years old. And my background personally is in neuroscience, so I came out of the lab myself. And when I co-founded My Green Lab, we were really heavily focused on things that scientists could do in their labs to be more sustainable. And our focus was really on experimental protocols, looking at green chemistry, looking at ways of reducing toxic chemicals. As somebody who had been in the lab before, I never thought about energy. It just never occurred to me to even think about it. I also never really thought about water, which is awful to say, but it's the truth. So when people started coming up to us and saying, well, this is great, the work that you're doing on toxic chemical reductions, but what about energy? We said, well, that's a good point. Let's see what we can do. And we started digging into things that people were doing in their labs around the equipment that they're using and other things that they're doing around energy. And of course, a lot of wonderful work had been done around ventilation, but not so much around laboratory equipment. And we saw that there was a real need for some standard data around plug loads because we've got great studies that are being done in different locations, you know, submetering and things that are being done in the field, but no standard testing, no standard facility to test laboratory equipment, and really no numbers associated with any laboratory equipment whatsoever. So it was very hard to make recommendations to scientists about what to purchase and also about what they should do with their equipment aside from just turning it off. So that's the general context. So with this in mind, we co-founded the Center for Energy Efficient Laboratories um, with two other partners that you'll see in the presentation. And so the, this presentation is going to be broken up into three different sections. The first is what our pitch was for creating the Center for Energy Efficient Laboratories, because when we had this great idea, we had to get it funded somehow. So we went to the California utility companies to try to get funding for it. So you'll see, understand and see you know, the need for something like this. And then you'll see in this, the middle part of the presentation what it was that we did in order to convince the utility companies that plug loads and laboratories were a worthwhile market segment. So that's going to be the bulk of, of what we're talking about. And then at the end, you'll see the outcome of the research that we did and how we're moving forward in looking at laboratory plug loads. And I hope that I can manage to work this correctly. I see. Okay. So the very first thing we talked about with, to the utility companies are that first and foremost, right, we've talked about this today, that laboratories are the largest consumers of energy at research universities. And although some of you might argue with these next two points, California has the most research universities in the country as well as the highest density of the biotech and pharmaceutical companies. Now I know that that last point kind of varies depending on what year you're looking at. Um, California, Massachusetts kind of go neck and neck. But the good news is that a lot of the data that I'm going to present here, because the markets are so similar, are very extrapolatable to the market here in Massachusetts. So why are labs so energy intensive? Well, obviously we know ventilation requirements, but of course, again, labs contain many pieces of, of equipment that are usually operating 24-7. So that contributes not only to energy consumption from the plug load itself, but also driving ventilation, which several groups have also alluded to. So we have all sorts of pieces of equipment found in laboratories, and many of these, with the exception really of the freezers, are pretty much absent from conversations about energy efficiency in laboratories. The thing is, right, as I talked about, that little is known or communicated by vendors, by end users, by utility companies about energy consumption in laboratories, and the market size by and large, really before we became involved, was really unknown. You know, how many labs are there? What's the square footage of laboratory space? What kind of equipment is out there and how much of it is there? I mean, this is, is this really significant or, or really is it just freezers that are significant? And then we have this other um, issue, which is that, you know, people when they design facilities, we've got our architects, they talk to facility end users and they might talk to energy managers. And facility end users and energy managers might talk to each other, but nobody's talking to the scientists so much when they're designing facilities, right? Which Mark alluded to that when we need, to, when we're talking about designing new facilities, you really should be including the scientists 
a little bit more in looking at realistic plug loads. And what this translates to, of course, is that the people who purchase the equipment are not paying the, the utility bills, and the vendors are only talking to the people who purchase the equipment, which means that vendors are therefore not incentivized to really engineer their products to be energy efficient because they're only talking to people who never think about energy efficiency. So we needed to do something to sort of break this up and get everybody talking to each other. And this sort of problem or opportunity, however you want to look at it, is something that actually exists in many market segments and was something that 25 years ago in the food service industry also existed. So there's a model for addressing kind of issues like this in the food service industry. And this is the model. So they, with utility support, have created something called the Food Service Technology Center. This is based in California. And in fact, if anybody has been in a kitchen, a commercial kitchen, you will see the impact of their work. Because though they're based in California, all of the work that they do reverberates across the United States. So utility companies and other entities, commercial entities, pick up their work you know, across the US. So it's a really nice model for that as well. And they do many disparate things. So they engage with industry stakeholders and they do outreach, they do market research and training, they do audits. And very importantly for our conversation, they do third-party testing and certification in order to lead to deemed rebates and customized incentive support. And it's this last component that's incredibly important when we're talking about um, laboratory plug loads, as well as the others, but it's really this last one that was missing. So we thought well, we should take this model. Oops, oh my goodness, this is touchy. Wow, okay. Oh, oh, okay. Um, and just replace it with a seal, <laughs> okay. Um, so the SEAL stands for the Center for Energy Efficient Laboratories. So this next slide are the, the kind of the key uh, core team members of the Center for Energy Efficient Laboratories. Of course, we have our nonprofit, My Green Lab. KW Engineering, they're based out of Oakland. They do a lot of fantastic work in whole buildings, looking at um, doing audits, um, deem measure work papers, things like, like that. And then we also brought in the Food Service Technology Center because they're an existing test facility that knows how to test a lot of the types, of similar types of equipment that are already found in labs, like refrigeration, like sterilizers. So we brought them in to do the third party equipment testing. So we didn't have to build a facility, but we could make use of existing facilities. Okay, so we, we gave all this information to the utility companies and they said to us, right, so how many labs are there? And is this really a relevant market segment? And are we gonna save any energy if we invest in this? Because the food service industry is very visible. And it's clear that there are a lot of food service entities right across the state of California. But laboratory spaces, who knew? So they asked us to do a market assessment. And the, what I'm going to present to you now are the results of that market assessment, bearing in mind that this was meant to convince the utility companies, of course, that this was a worthwhile endeavor. So we had some very specific goals in mind. Number one, we needed to define and characterize laboratory spaces. Number two, we wanted to estimate and quantify the usage of common, common laboratory plug loads. And then, really importantly, we wanted to understand stakeholder attitudes about energy efficiency. And really what that means is, do scientists care about energy efficiency? Because if we go through this process of identifying energy efficient laboratory equipment and certifying laboratory equipment, but we get to the scientists and they say, you know what, I really don't care then we might not want to have gone through the effort of the first two points. And then finally, of course, we wanted to identify opportunities for energy efficient equipment. So just some housekeeping things on definitions. We broadly defined a lab as any space equipped to conduct experiments, tests, investigations, et cetera, or manufacture chemicals, equipment, um, medicines, or the like. This is very broadly defined because we wanted to make sure that eventually we could capture as much of the market as possible. But for this particular assessment, we focused on three main areas. Oh my goodness. Wow. Okay. Okay. L academic labs, life science research labs, and hospital labs. I think academic labs and hospital labs are pretty self-explanatory. Life science research is what we used as a term, as a catch-all for biotech, pharmaceutical companies, and contract research organizations. You'll notice that, that absent from this study were anything that I would call industrial labs. So things um, that make, places that make chemicals, for example. So DuPont wasn't included, Chevron wasn't included, places like that. Um, and the, the reason for that was, there were actually many reasons, but by and large was simply that we really wanted to capture a bit of the market that had already been engaged in energy efficiency projects. And that was mostly these, these key market areas. 
So we collected information for um, square footage information for 171 academic institutions, 1,351 life science research organizations, and 532 hospitals. So we collected a tremendous amount of information um, across the state of California around square footage and how people were using their space. When it came to looking at laboratory equipment, we asked, we surveyed scientists as well as facility and energy managers about what was found in their laboratory spaces. You can see that we had a lot of respondents to our online survey, about 1,200 across the U.S. for scientists and about 78 for facility and energy managers. Of course, online surveys can only capture so much information, so we also did in-person interviews with 371 scientists in the U.S. and 14 facility managers. So again, we collected a tremendous amount of, of information from people. We asked them about 32 different pieces of equipment across seven product categories, and those are listed here. Um, refrigeration is an obvious one. Fume hoods I'm going to hold off on for a second because those are obviously not plug loads. Um, microscopes, benchtop equipment, anything that you would find on a bench. Large uh, laboratory equipment, anything that doesn't fit on a bench. Hospital equipment, so MRIs, CAT scans, x-ray machines, machines, as well as equipment rooms, so warm and cold rooms. Fume hoods were in there because fume hoods were the only thing that we could find that had already been studied in laboratories. So LBNL had done a study about 10 years ago estimating the, the number of fume hoods across the country as well, as well as in California. So we felt that if we studied fume hoods as well and we came up with a number that was similar to theirs, then we could have some confidence in our data. Whereas if we came up with a number that was really drastically different, we would want to either go back and look at their data method co of collection or look at ours and, and kind of figure out what had gone awry there. Okay, so who responded to this crazy survey, <laughs> which contained, obviously it was about 30 pages on third survey monkey. It was a very, very extensive survey. Oh, sorry. Okay, so not surprisingly, the majority of respondents were from academic labs. Uh, no offense to academic labs, but I think they had a bit more time to <laughs> sit and respond to that survey. But we also had a healthy number of respondents from life science researchers, hospitals, and this other segment that, that I, is really nonprofit. So this would be government labs, any sort of laboratory that, that operates as a nonprofit. This graph is just meant to, to demonstrate that we had respondents from a number of different disciplines. So chemistry, biology, um, physics, systems biology, testing labs, et cetera. It didn't just fall into one particular category. If we look at the roles of people in the, in the lab, you can see that more than 50% of the respondents were actually key decision makers in the lab, so either PIs or laboratory managers, and the rest were scientists. So scientists is a catch-all term for undergraduates, graduate students, and postdocs. Um, this was really encouraging because we start to ask the question about does energy efficiency matter when you purchase equipment, it's really important that the people who are making that decision are responding to our survey. And if we look at the other side of things, looking at facility managers, you could see that the majority of people who responded to that, those questions were facility managers, but again we had still some respondents from EHS and from sustainability, again providing a really nice well-rounded perspective on energy efficiency in laboratories and plug loads. Okay, so what were the results? Square footage of laboratory space. I feel like there should be a drum roll. Um, okay, so in academic labs, about 37 million across the state of California. Life science research, about twice that, 68 million. All told, about 116 million square feet of laboratory space. This number was meant to be very conservative. We did not want to oversell the program to the utility company, so we went with as the most conservative numbers that we could come up with. Nevertheless, this is a tremendous amount of square footage. This represents about 3.5% of the total commercial available square footage in the state of California. When you compare this with the food service industry, right, because we're doing this comparison with the food service industry at the beginning, food service industry is about 170 million square feet of laboratory space. Bearing in mind that this does not represent all of the laboratory space in the state, remember I told you that we left out the entire industrial segment, you can see that laboratory space really approaches, if not possibly exceeds, the amount of square footage for the food service industry. Which I don't know if that surprises any of you, but I think it surprised even me, and I've been working in labs for Oh gosh, a long time now. Um, I didn't expect it to be quite that high. If we extrapolate that out to the rest of the United States, assuming that California usually accounts for about 10% of the market, you can see that we're talking, at, oh goodness, about 1.2 billion square feet of laboratory space across the United States. So this is something that is worth paying attention to, and I think we all know that because that's why we're all here, um, but it's good for us to be making this case with numbers. 
Then we wanted to look at the total number of labs. So we asked respondents to, say, to tell us, what is the average square footage of your laboratory space? And then we did a very simple calculation, right, for each market segment, looking at the total amount of square footage divided by the average square footage per lab to get an average number of total number of labs. So this number, you know, to be taken a bit with a grain of salt because it was self-reported, we're getting about 20,000 laboratories in this particular, these three market segments in California. Again, extrapolated to the rest of the United States, about 200,000 laboratories. That's a, a tremendous number of people, right, who are affected and impacted by the work that we're, that we're doing. Um, and again, a, a large number of laboratories. So broadly looking at equipment estimates, if we ask facility managers, you know, what does it look like? What kind of pieces of equipment do you have in your facilities? You can see that by and large, laboratory facilities are pretty similar. And that was another thing that we heard when we were talking to people about plug loads was that, oh my goodness, plug loads, they're so different because each lab is so unique and does, its, does different types of research. We can't really generalize across laboratory spaces. And while that may be true for very highly specialized pieces of equipment, it's quite clear that when we surveyed facility managers, and, and not terribly surprisingly, right, there are a lot of pieces of laboratory equipment that are very common across laboratories. So freezers, for example, fume hoods, microscopes, centrifuges, autoclaves, even things like lasers and x-ray machines, which I would have thought would have been more highly specialized, are still very commonly found across many facilities in the US. So this gives us some hope that programs that we might be implementing here uh, will affect all laboratories, or at least a substantial portion of laboratories, and not be highly specific towards one lab type of lab or another. So I'm going to go through some of the equipment estimate results for a few pieces of equipment kind of in depth, and then we're going to go back and generalize them, because all of this is included in the report, and it's, there's obviously 32 pieces of equipment. It can get tedious, so I'll just kind of go <laughs> high level here. Um, freezers is something that people have been really interested in, so I wanted to make sure that we highlighted this. So you can see minus 80 freezers, average number per lab in California and the United States, broken out by market segment. We're looking at slightly higher numbers in California than the rest of the United States. We also looked at Massachusetts specifically um, because we were wondering why California's numbers were so high. And we found that Massachusetts numbers were also higher than the rest of the country. And we think that that might have something to do with funding. It tends to correlate pretty well that the more highly funded a lab is, the more things they buy. So, um, so you can kind of look at the California numbers and, and exchange the CA for an MA and be pretty close. So you can see it's about three minus 80 freezers per lab, about four minus 20 freezers per lab, and about five minus, uh, about five four degree refrigerators per lab. It's a lot. That's, that surprised, again, it surprised me that there were so many per laboratory. Um, so laboratory refrigeration is obviously an area where we can really have an impact in terms of plug load. And I just wanted to point out that, of course, some market segments had more than others. So life science research and biotech and pharmaceutical companies in general tended to have more equipment than academia. And again, that's not terribly surprising just given the amount of money that flows into those, those markets. If we look at fume hoods, which again, we're going to be used as our benchmark, you can see that we're looking at about three per lab, whether we're in California or in the, or in the United States. And if we look at microscopes, and it'll be clear why I, why I specifically call out microscopes here, you can see that fluorescence microscopes and confocal microscopes, again, are found pretty widely in laboratories. So this is the total number, the top 15 pieces of equipment. And the, th the key thing here to point out, if I can not mess up the laser pointer, oh good, okay, I'm gonna get one thing working on this, is that here's our, here's our refrigeration here. Here's our ventilation, and then this is what I would call tabletop equipment, up to about here. And then when we get to autoclaves here, tissue culture hoods, incubators, these are large laboratory pieces of laboratory equipment. And the, the key thing to see is that with the exception of autoclaves, there's an average of more than one per lab. So again, this is relatively universal. We took these 15 pieces of equipment and then said, okay, well, what does that mean in terms of energy consumption? And what does that mean if we extrapolate that into numbers of pieces of equipment across the state? Okay, we'll just go here. This is a good slide. Okay, so we took the average number of pieces of equipment per lab and multiplied it by the number of labs. Pretty straightforward. And you can see that 
we'll look at minus 80 freezers because I think everybody here in the room is pretty familiar with those. We found that there are about 60,000 of them in the state of California. Again, a very conservative estimate just for this market segment, which if we look at the rest of the United States would then put us at about over half a million, so about 600,000 of those. So quite a lot. The United States. So this is the rest of the United States. You can see the numbers are a little bit broader. I want to call your attention to fume hoods. The LBNL estimate for fume hoods was 750,000 fume hoods in the US. We estimated between half a million and a million, so smack in the middle. So that gives us some confidence that our data are, are good. Given the number of respondents and just the breadth of the study, it's not too surprising, right? I think it was a pretty comprehensive study. Um, but it's nice to know that we're falling within that range of something that's already been published. So again, you can see that there's a well over a million pieces of these types of equipment, so a real opportunity here. So now let's talk about energy consumption. So we ourselves did not do any, any metering for this study, which is partially why these pieces of equipment were chosen, because there were some data that had been published on them already. The reason we didn't do any metering for this study, study was one, to meter all these pieces of equipment would have been a huge undertaking. And two, we wanted to actually do this in a systematic and standardized fashion, and that required additional funding in order to get that done. So we took published data to be able to make the case for further funding. And that data is shown here. So you can see here, we took published results. We also show here the average number of usage hours of use per day. What's interesting is that the ones that are on for 24 hours, right, those are the pieces of equipment that we can do something about in terms of talking to manufacturers about designing their equipment better. All the ones that are used less than 24 hours a day, three hours a day, four hours a day, but are left on for 24 hours a day, those are opportunities for behavioral change. Right, so just from, from asking the simple question of how many hours are you actually using this piece of equipment, we can pretty clearly see what are the ones we want to target with manufacturers and what are the ones we want to target with behavioral change programs. You can see that we took published data here. Some of them were energy use per year, some of them were per week, some of them had been done per day, and calculated out the energy consumption range. And that's shown here. So all in all, these 15 pieces of equipment, again, 15 out of the 32 that we studied, which were a small, small subset of the hundreds that are found in laboratories, are about three terawatt hours a year in energy consumption. To put that in perspective, that's about 2% of the total electrical energy consumption for commercial buildings in California, so for plug loads. So that's a, it's a lot. It's, not, it's certainly not um, inconsequential or unsubstantial. We have enough information to address things in the blue box now, which is why you saw that information about fluorescent microscopes, meaning that people have reliably metered these pieces of equipment, so we have a lot of data, and there are energy efficient options that are already available on the market, so there's something we can do about them. Everything here in the orange box, these are things that the, the these are pieces of equipment for which the data were either not really that not that great, they were done um, maybe one or two field tests as opposed to 15 or 20 field tests that we have for the other ones. And or we really don't have any information about energy efficient models or energy efficiency opportunities. So these are ones that we would have to investigate further. So moving forward with the ones that there, there's enough information to address now, this is what is going to be the subject of, of the latter part of this presentation. Oops. So now we know what I think all of us in this room probably already knew, which is that there are a lot of labs, right? They have a lot of equipment, and that equipment uses a lot of energy. But now we know it for, for sure. Um, but do scientists care? That's really a, a very important question, because they're the ones who are going to be purchasing this equipment. Well, we ask them, OK, do you consider energy efficiency when purchasing new equipment? And by and large, we broke out again California with the US. The US was even higher than California. The majority of people said yes, they consider it. This we found really interesting because we weren't really sure what they were considering given that there's no published information about energy efficiency um, with laboratory equipment. But I think it speaks to the fact that they would want to if there were information about it. We asked them about, generally speaking, about sustainability. You can see here hazardous materials are in blue. Water is shown here in red and energy in green. And we asked them how important are, are these things to you when you are purchasing new equipment? Very important or not at all important. So you can see that by 
the vast majority of people said that these things were either very important or important to them when purchasing new equipment. Very few people said it was not at all important. And again, this is a, this is a survey that was done anonymously. We weren't collecting any information or, or data from people. And we had write-ins so people could say whatever horrible things they wanted to say to us if they didn't care about this at all. But, but actually, people really do care about this. And I think they're just looking for an opportunity to, to exercise their concern and direct that towards making smart decisions with their purchasing and with their behavior. We asked them if an Energy Star rating would influence their purchasing, because this is very, of course, very important as we're working towards standards for laboratory equipment. And again, by and large, the vast majority said yes. And we asked them how much more would they be willing to pay for improved energy efficiency. Because of course this is very important when we're considering rebates and designing incentives for, for researchers. And this was a write-in. So we let them write in whatever amount they wanted. And you can see that the Californians were a bit more stingy than the rest of the US. Um, but here, between 5 and 10% more as a premium for energy efficient equ laboratory equipment. Um, so not zero. I mean, of course, zero got some, got some votes because these are scientists, after all, and they are frugal with their, with their grant money, which I can understand. Um, but, but with the majority, more than 50% falling between 5 and 10%, I think that's very encouraging for all of us to know that, that not only do people care about it, but they're willing to pay more for it. And we asked them about the impact of a rebate. And you can see that, again, more than 50% of people said that it would impact their purchasing decision, yes or somewhat. Um, very few, maybe 30% in the US said no. Um, I think these are the most honest people saying that they don't understand rebates. <laughs> um, but the people who said no, by and large, more than 50% wrote in that the reason they weren't interested in a rebate is they felt that it wouldn't come back to them. They felt that they wouldn't see the money. Um, so I think if we're smart in the way that we design our incentives, you would see that those people in the no column would switch to being in the yes. Okay, so what are the implications of these results for scientists, for manufacturers, for consultants and designers, for all the stakeholders who are interested in energy efficiency in laboratories? Oops. So for manufacturers, oh goodness, okay. No, I'm just gonna have to tell you, okay. There's, so there's a desire and a need for energy efficient products, right? So the, the market is interested in this. Um, and the reason they probably haven't heard about it is because scientists didn't think to ask and they were over there and if you remember that, that schematic from the previous slide, they're over there in their own silo, not speaking to anybody else. For designers, of course, as, as again, as was alluded to previously, there's a need to design laboratory spaces for realistic plug loads. For consultants, we can't ignore plug loads anymore. And I think plug loads are really starting to come into their own in the conversation. But when we started three years ago, plug loads were something that were really largely ignored, um, said to be not that important or too difficult to to really consider because the equipment was too highly specialized. So I think this is really giving us some, some real hard evidence that we need to really be considering these. And scientists, of course, there's an opportunity for behavioral change, both in terms of purchasing behavior as well in terms of just their over everyday operational behavior in the lab. Okay, so we, we finished this report in, in May and presented it to the utility companies and they said, right, yeah, okay, there's definitely an opportunity here. And for most of the people in this room, I'm sure you've been hearing a lot about the ultra low temperature freezers, how there's been a push to try to get Energy Star for ultra low temperature freezers for about eight to 10 years now. And there just hasn't, nothing's really moved on that front for a while. So that's where we decided to focus. So we said, okay, we looked at our, our data. The most obvious place to go was laboratory refrigeration. The biggest bang for our buck were ultra low temperature freezers. So again, shown here. So that's what we decided to address and that's what we're working on right now. So we've partnered again with the California utility companies as well as the EPA and Energy Star, Star and the ultra low temperature freezer manufacturers. And we are in the process right now of testing all of those, the major manufacturer freezers to the Energy Star test method in order to develop the standards for ultra low temperature freezers. So the goals of this are third-party independent testing as well as looking at plug load and HVAC interactions. So I had mentioned we have several partners. So the, the Food Service Technology Center is going to be doing, is currently doing rather the third-party independent testing and the plug load and HVAC interactions are being done by KW and more specifically 
Allison Farmer, who's sitting here in the front row. Um, we're very fortunate to have her working as part of this team and taking care of that component. So this is a very exciting time. We're finally actually making progress in laboratory plug loads. It looks like we're going to have standards um, for at least ultra low temperature freezers and then be able to use that as a model going forward, not only for laboratory refrigeration, but also for all of those other pieces of equ equipment that we mentioned. Additional opportunities, of course, education and outreach. So for those pieces of equipment, the ones that were in the orange box and the ones that we knew were not, we know are not being used 24-7, there's a lot of opportunities for us to, for all of us in this room and of course for our nonprofit in particular, to start educating people on what it means to turn off those pieces of equipment. How much energy can you really save? Um, and, and really start building a program around those as well as working with manufacturers to, to help design their equipment better. So when we look at things like the rest of the refrigeration, when we look at things like water baths, for example, could we build those in with an automatic timer rather than ask people to remember to turn them off? So there's a lot of design opportunities here as well. And then of course we're gonna be looking at other laboratory refrigeration, the minus 20s and the, and the four degree freezers. So this is the schematic that, or this is cartoon, I'm not sure what you call it, to, to show what the SEAL, the Center for Energy Efficient Laboratories, is doing and, and plans to do in the future. So look, working with utilities, laboratory end users, and equipment vendors, and really help provide all of you with the data that you need in order to make smart decisions about how you're going to direct your programs around laboratory plug loads, about how to incentivize end users and, and scientists and what they want and what to purchase in terms of energy efficiency. And then also to create these ENERGY STAR standards and to create um, customized incentives and, and rebates for laboratory equipment in order to drive this market towards energy efficiency and get that three terawatt hour estimate per year for plug loads down to something closer to one and a half or one, which I think is very realistic and given the data that we have. So we know that in the next three years that laboratory space is actually going to be increasing. 30% um, of people who answered our survey said they expected their space to increase. The rest of the people said basically stayed the same. Very few people expected it to decrease. So this is an opportunity that's going to just be more of an opportunity in the future and isn't something that's going to be going away. So it's good that we're talking about it now as we see that our lab spaces are growing and expanding. So I'd like to thank our, our funders, Pacific Gas and Electric, San Diego Gas and Electric, and Southern California Edison um, for all of their, their support with this project, as well as our, our partners, our SEAL partners. FNI stands for Fisher and Nickel Incorporated. They're the ones who run the Food Service Technology Center. And then, of course, KW Engineering, without whose help, we would certainly not be where we are today and gotten so much off the ground. And of course, specifically to Allison Farmer, who did some fantastic work on the initial report and is also really helping us bring plug loads and HVAC together so that we can talk about plug loads and, and ventilation in a, a comprehensive manner.